Welcome to the show. I'm Luke, and I'm joined here by champion Aldi Edwards. Aldi, welcome to the show, buddy. Adley Edwards. Adley, yes, and of course, I got your name wrong after being so confident. Adley, <laughs> welcome to the show, bud. Thanks for having me again. Well, although I butchered your name, it's great having you back on the show. I feel like this we're getting into routine of doing this, which is just so wonderful. So last time we had you on, you were talking about your upcoming title fight, which just happened a little under a week ago um, for Hard Rock Cafe in Kentucky. So let's jump right into it. You are the champ. So obviously you won, but let's go, let's go through the fight. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, up in his, uh, near his hometown, uh, fought Lance Lawrence, uh, contender series vet. And, uh, we went up there and we got the job done, got the W he was a tough kid. Um, you know, definitely durable, you know, dangerous, but we got in there and dominated, uh, it's about every moment of every round. It was, a uh, it was a fun performance. And I think that really put a stamp on hopefully my regional MMA career. I think that, uh, that hopefully sets me up for some bigger and better things here moving on. Absolutely. And to remind the fans, last summer, but the, the non-COVID summer, last summer you were set to be on Dana White Contender Series. You got injured. And then ever since then, uh, you know, COVID and everything else happened. Um, so what's it like for you? You said before the fight that you feel like you could already be in the UFC. This was a UFC caliber opponent. This was like a fight that could happen in the UFC. So what's it like for you to be at that level where you were last year, but probably even a tick above it now with this win? Yeah, honestly, a couple ticks, I think. I think last year I was ready. This year I'm I'm not as ready to compete in the UFC. I'm ready to dominate in there. I feel really good, man. It was uh, validating, I think, going out there and being able to perform well, especially after a layoff like that. Um, and I, I I proved to myself what I thought what I thought I was capable of, which was – you know, not missing a beat and getting right after it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And before we get to your injury, because that'll be part of what we discuss. Um, right. But before yeah. we get to it, what was the, in the fight, what was the moment you, you dominated, you won by decision, which in some ways is more difficult because you have to dominate for a longer period of time, as opposed to catching somebody, not that catching somebody is bad, but you, you know, you can win 12, a 12 second situation and get a submission as opposed to um, a decision. So what were the highlights for you performance wise? What do you remember happening in there that you felt, okay, this is really nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, going into the fight, we knew Lance is super durable. That dude's got a head of steel. He have, we've seen him take heavy shots in other fights. We knew he'd be hard to put away. We knew he had fantastic jujitsu. I mean, he's got all finishes. His only loss was a decision against a guy who, I heard uh, Friday night that I weighed him by like 20 pounds on contender series. The guy missed weight. And by the time oh, it was Friday night, yeah. he was really outmatched. Um, so he's tough and he's hard to put away and he's dangerous. So I knew he's going to have an attrition style. He's going to come in there. He's going to get in my face. Um, he's scrappy. And I think it was great for me to be able to prove that his jiu-jitsu wasn't even close. He didn't get close to a single submission. I dominated every grappling exchange. I was dominating the exchanges on the feet. And uh, I was able to smash through him there. Um, I, I feel like I checked every box that I wanted to in the fight. In that cage, that B2MA cage, when I got in there, I mean, we are a half stride away from the other side of the cage. It is tiny. So we were right on top of each other, scrapping the whole time. It was, uh, it was definitely action-packed. Not a lot of dull moments in that fight. Well, you know, since you bring up cage size, the last time the cage size was really an issue, at least in the UFC, was all the lead up to DC versus uh, Stipe. You know, there was a lot of conversation on that. How much did you feel the cage while you were in there fighting? Did you feel like I, I don't have the space or did you like feeling tight? You know, for me, I mean, I'm a great grappler. So when we're on top of each other, it always favors me. But I've been working a lot with Marcus Davis on some really slick striking and traps and setups. And I really wanted to showcase that. But I mean, Lance has got like a 70, probably like four inch reach. I know, you know, mine's right there with him. We're, we're lanky long guys. We could almost like touch one side of the cage and clap hands in the middle. So there wasn't a lot of room for maneuvering. We were just going. So uh, it was definitely uh, a little limiting in some of the things I was able to do, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, it made for a fun fight. I think it was a 20-foot cage is what it looked like in there. Yeah. So that's, that's tiny. Yeah, it is tiny. It's also a thing, I guess, in a way, and this is going to sound bizarre, but it's I guess it's similar to baseball in the sense that the outfield can be different sizes and shapes because I think a lot of people, 
have the mindset that it's a consistent size. And then they start watching MMA and their circles. Some MMA is still done in, in boxing rings, which doesn't make the most sense, but you know, there's still some of that. There's the octagon, there's a bunch of different sizes. And even the UFC has three or four different cage sizes yeah. they use. So that's interesting. Um, I saw sense. that you got, I saw that you were getting interviewed by Chris Lights Out Lytle by the, at the end. That's his promotion, right? Yes, sir. And he, he was awesome. I, I met him for the first time uh, earlier that week uh, during the weigh-ins and super cool personality. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, talking with him. Yeah, we were talking about that before the fight coming up, how, uh, how great it is to be able to fight as a fighter for a former fighter who's he's probably a little bit less uh, known by today's UFC fans. But if you know the UFC, um, he was a heck of a fighter for a long, long oh, yeah. time. Um, and you I don't saw, know, you need to know. Go look oh, that yeah. dude up. Oh, yeah. he's, the guy, he's the guy people absolutely need to know. He's, he's one of those you can watch his whole career and really have a good time with it. Um, at the end of the fight, you know, he came in and was interviewing you and you made your, you made your shout out to the UFC. Are you thinking UFC or what is it Bellator? Like I, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but are you geared into UFC? Dude, I want to fight the best in the world. And Bellator's got some great fighters. PFL has got great fighters. There's good guys all over. My weight class is stacked. I think most guys kind of fill in that 55, 45 pound range, but oh, yeah. Hey, UFC is where the, the best of the best are. I know there's guys who can compete from those other organizations, but my goal is to be the world champion and I want to compete against the world. And I want to beat the best. So uh, I think the UFC is the best place to do it. They're all, they're more or less all under one roof over there. Let's keep it simple. Absolutely. Let's get in there and uh, get after it. Absolutely. And, and that's the, and that's the real blessing that you're at a point where you could kind of say, that's my goal. That's where I want to be. Um, I, I hesitate to make too much of a big deal about your injury. Um, so I go for it, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I want to, I want to highlight the fact that from what you said on Facebook, you hurt your hand in the first round, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got surgery uh, like two days ago. I uh, bust my hand. I think one of the first exchanges on the ground, I started letting those hands go in something has there was something hard in that dude's head. That's for sure. <laughs> I felt a sharp right away. You know, I kept letting those hands go. You know, your knuckles always hurt when you're hitting people really hard. And, uh, you know, after the first round, I didn't even say anything in my corners. I thought it was just, you know, normal swelling there. And then immediately in that second round, I went to grab him and I couldn't even put my fingers around his wrist. My knuckle broke right at the uh, a bone broke right at the knuckle. So I couldn't really compress it too much. And the x-rays, I mean, you could tell that knuckle, that bone fragment slid under. And every time I went to grab, it was like pushing into it. Man, it was swollen up like a Mickey Mouse glove. Um, it was pretty gross in there when I took my wraps off. So it definitely made it a little tricky. And as much as I wanted to hit him with the left hand, that dude's scrappy. So I had to hold him at the left, wait for him to get close and hit him with the right elbow. So I had to make some adjustments in there. Um, and like I said, he's durable. So he made a, he made it a challenging fight for sure. Well, the word adjustments is why I was bringing up your injury. Cause I'm not trying to make the injury, the focus, the focus of the fight is that you dominated a UFC caliber opponent and you belong in the UFC. Absolutely. That's the focus. If anything, your injury in the first round just shows the fact that you can work your way around a fairly significant problem and continue to be dominant. I suppose there's times and hats off to the guys that fight through an injury, but there's times towards the end of a fight, if somebody's injured, they kind of go into defense escape mode. And obviously you couldn't because it was the first round. You had to still continue yeah. to win. Um, Lance is a dude you don't want to be on the back foot with. That dude's going to come forward. And I mean, he was in it to win it. That dude's a gamer and he's, he's scrappy and he, he, he knew it was going to be a war and he needed to finish in that third. So I wasn't letting up. I was hunting for finishes the whole time. If you don't get that guy uh, on the defense, you're in trouble. Well, that's exactly the attitude of a fighter. If you go into the third round, knowing you're up to and start backpedaling, Sure, he can't win it. He can't win it on decision, but he could potentially get a sub or get something he likes if you start giving him the angles that he likes or the looks that he likes. So I don't want to give anybody the satisfaction of knowing I was winning. If this kept going, I was going to beat. I want people to be like that was terrible and it was getting worse. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't want people clamoring for a rematch. I want people to know where it's we stand, done. and that's yeah. my goal. I want people to to remember my fights. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's a, and that's an incredible quote right there that you want people to remember your fights and not, and not want to rematch. Um, <laughs> when you, when you talk about your surgery, it looks like obviously um, that was smart to get the surgery as soon as after the fight. I mean, it just happened. Um, 
don't give anything away you don't want to but what's the recovery time like i mean it, did they yeah, they said uh, it's usually like 12 weeks, I guess, and then okay. 10 if I had the surgery. So it saved me like two weeks. Um, and that's, you know, just uh, back to normal training. So hopefully I can have a, you know, I'm, I just finished some cardio now. I was doing two a day the other day. Like I'm working out, you know, nonstop doing what I can. So as soon as uh, I can start punching things, you know, we'll hop right into training camp and hopefully a quick turnaround. I'd like to fight uh, late winter, early spring. I should be game. Okay. Hopefully for that UFC call. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's what that's why I got into the hand injury because I knew that we've been talking both before this fight and I've had other uh, guys on from the Contender Series and UFC and they were saying that like right now since COVID restrictions could actually be increasing at some point because some of the COVID concerns are coming back. But the UFC has really shown during the COVID that they like fighters who want to fight and those fighters getting multiple and obviously you with your your injury, but come late winter, like you're saying, it could be great for you to get in there while some people are still having COVID restrictions. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm ready to get after it. I mean, as soon as they're ready, you know, let's rattle them off. I want to get in there and get active and, you know, get in the top of those rankings. Given the fact that your right hand is currently rehabbing, um, what, what positive do you think comes out of not being able to use that weapon. I'm just talking hitting, hitting a punching bag or hitting a bob, you know, the beat on buddy, because I've had fighters before say that when, when they take a weapon away, they end up developing, particularly in striking. And you mentioned uh, being trained by the Irish hand grenade as it is. So do, do you think there's an element that they might, that, that you might be able to work on your stand up without Absolutely. the I mean, right hand? Obviously we can do all sorts of footwork and, you know, elbows and knees and stuff, but, uh, Hey, Marcus is a fantastic southpaw. My other striking coach, Josh Brackett, is also a southpaw. Like, I got good southpaws, a lot of good lefties around me. The gym I was at in Columbus before I moved down here, I think most of the guys were left-handed. So, I, you know, I, I like the style. I think there's a lot of good options for it. And actually something I was working on mm. a little bit this summer. And I think this is a good as opportunity as any to, to sharpen those skills and add, uh, add that skill set in the rotation. It is, absolutely. When you were talking about the 145, 155-pound division, which in the UFC has been the two, I mean, two of the strongest divisions for years now, um, at that, particularly at that slighter weight, a lot more versatility comes out in that weight class uh, when, you, when you think of some of the styles, that switch stance or that ability to go between uh, stances is very important. And it sounds like you're headed in the direction of wanting to be fluid in there as opposed to always having to reset to orthodox the more positions i can be dangerous in the better i just want to be able to put people away and hurt them in every position everywhere i want people to be uncomfortable absolutely and that's the uh that's the feeling that's the feeling dangerous you mentioned ohio so i'm guessing columbus so i'm guessing you would know that that's what uh baker mayfield said right i'm feeling dangerous um, that was like his rookie year. So you just sounded like Baker Mayfield. Or Baker Mayfield just sounded like you, whatever. All right. But, uh, <laughs> you're now on a six six fight win streak. Um, mm -hmm. And so that meant that you had a two and one record, three fights into your pro career. What's it like to go from two and one where that's not bad, three fights into your pro career, but obviously it could go either way at that point in a, in a record, you know? So what's it like to make the changes you've made and develop the uh, record you have now? You know, I'm just, I, I don't know. I, I like my record. Six, six win streaks, not doing too bad. But, um, hey, man, I'm, I was one scorecard away from a, a perfect record. You know, I lost that split decision. But um, record aside, I mean, my skill set's developing every fight. I'm getting better and better and better. And I'm working on specific things that I know I can round on my game and, and, and close the few opportunities people have to, to put points on the board and score on me uh off so i think my trajectory is looking better and better i don't plan to lose anytime soon i think it's good it's, it's downhill from here for my opponents what's it like to honestly see constant growth like as a fighter sometimes fighters kind of lie to themselves you know and convince themselves um ben Askren comes to mind but i know throwing shade on ben Askren. not i'm not trying to but people have pointed out some of his weaknesses some of his issues and he was fairly insistent that he'll just keep doing what was winning which is great but then he had that weakness so what's it like to constantly see uh your skill set ratcheting up like you're talking about i love it man i'm all about the growth i want to be the best i can be i'm very unsatisfied i i hate complacency i'm always trying to 
to, to improve. I think one thing that I do uh, that maybe a lot of guys don't do is I'm very critical. The first thing after my fight, I wasn't happy with my performance. I wanted that finish. I saw my coaches, you know, they were all happy. I got the win. I think I got hit like maybe two, three times in that fight. And, uh, you know, we're sitting down there and I, the only thing I wanted to do the night of my fight is create a list of things I should improve on and do better. You know, that's what I spent all week doing is plotting out my next camp. I'm all about figuring out what the next steps are. And uh, I uh, honestly enjoy doing that. I know that's weird, but <laughs> well, that's I, the, like, I, I like I, fixing things. That's the mindset of a champion. Because when you think about it, when your coaches have to be the ones trying to convince the fighter that they need to improve, that ends up sometimes being confrontational or just the fighter feels stressed or feel pressure. When you're the fighter telling the coaches where you need to see improvement, then they can build that plan. And then you're all on the same page and it probably works a lot smoother. Yeah, I'm, I'm fishing for criticism. Any opportunity, any, I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I want to, I want to be the best. I don't want to be, you know, exposed for something um, yeah. that could have been avoided. And I think that's the mindset, particularly in the individual world of fighting, is that you want to, you want to firm up things that haven't happened yet, but you don't want them to happen. You want to predict things that haven't even taken place. Let's take yet. care of it. Let's fix it before somebody even finds us a problem. That's that's the way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what's it like in your life? You're a married guy. You have kids. What's it like balancing uh, work, life, fighting, and also having, I believe you have at least one daughter, if not two. Yeah, two, two so girls. Um, two girls. There you go. It's, it's tough, man. It's a balancing act. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I lean heavily on my wife to, to help take care of things. She's awesome. Um, our girls are a handful. They're, they're, they're fun characters. <laughs> um definitely keep us busy so uh it's nice to have my wife be able to help out especially when we get a fight camp and you know our training camp their training time increases i'm spending more time watching film yeah. you know visualizing do all that mental prep it's hard to be a, a father and a fighter and also work and make money for you know supporting us it's uh it's a lot to juggle so thankfully i've got a great support system well obviously shout out to your wife and kids and that's the yeah, aspect thank you, Maggie. of Maggie. You're the best. <laughs> uh, there you go. Shout out to Maggie. That is wonderful. Now, in a way, with this injury, you're not able to do all, like, if, if you weren't injured at all, you'd be looking, you'd probably tell me you'd want to fight in December, late December for the UFC. So does this give you a little bit of home time now as you got to rest up and heal? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, my daughter, Mia, her birthday is the day after Thanksgiving. And then my wife's uh, birthday is uh, next week. And I can't remember a Thanksgiving or the holiday season that I haven't been cutting weight for a fight. Mm. Now, some of those fights don't even happen, but regardless, you know, I'm not just trying to eat some pumpkin pie or something. This is the first time, maybe since we've actually even been together, that we can all sit down and celebrate for the month and, and relax and be a little bit more, uh, you know, less, less doubt and stress about a, a competition coming up. So I think it's really good. And I think our family definitely needs it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to spending that, that quality time with them. Well, that's a blessing there for sure. And there's a fight promotion, regional fight promotion in Pittsburgh that's having two cards, one the day before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve, and one the Saturday after. And of course, every fighter I've asked on the Saturday after card is not happy to have to be cutting weight during Thanksgiving. So uh -huh. like you're saying, it really does, that does really become aware on a uh, on a fighter, you know, as far as there's a UFC has done a ton of uh, New Year's Eve cards and, you know, those type of events and, and fighters end up um, people, really. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say people ahead. don't understand really that uh, even if you're a fighter, like I don't mind doing that. I will sacrifice all day, but it does put a strain on your relationships with your family, with your friends. And uh, that's where the wear and tear comes down and the mental stress. And it's nice to <laughs> not have to do those every time. <laughs> Well, that's you're right about that for sure you're the athlete you know the discipline it takes and what your body can do for the cup but then it ends up affecting what the family can celebrate so at least you've got a great thanksgiving coming up where you can uh be thankful obviously for just a wonderful performance uh when you're looking because you've said specifically UFC when you're looking UFC um give me a quick bird's eye view from your perspective on 145 and 155 as far as you want to call out names or if you want to start talking about kind of what the landscape looks at 45 and 55 um because obviously you're you're focused on ufc so let's start talking about some of the ufc stuff 
Okay. Um, I don't know if I want to, you know, call out anybody, but I'll take out. I feel like I'm going to take out everybody in that division. I feel like I'm a really bad style matchup. Featherweight, that's my weight class. I mean, I could fight at 55 if I need to. I'm not worried about doing that. I'm strong enough there, but uh, 45 is where my eyes are at. And I think they have a lot of good guys there with a lot of skills, but all of them have holes in their game. And I just don't think they're good style matchups for me. I'm too explosive. I'm too quick. My ground game's too good. I'm, I think they're going to have a hard time. I can't think of anybody there that would be uh, excited about fighting me. Well, that's definitely the perfect – uh, humble way to say it. You've got the confidence that you could take out anybody, but yes, I do think sometimes dropping names gets a little, uh, you know, just messy yeah, or whatever. Everybody's so, trying to make their living and do their thing over there. You know, I'm yeah. going to wait for that call. Whoever they say, it's, it's a yes, let's get it. So I'm ready for it. Now you mentioned making a living and obviously something I always try to point out when I have regional fighters on is that the vast majority of regional fighters, if not all of them, are, are bivocational, right? Where they have to, you got a, a day job. Um, is that something you're going to figure out once you've been fighting the UFC for a little bit, get a couple fights and then figure out the finances? Or if you got a contract, would you drop your current job? Because I know some fighters drop right before the UFC or some fighters try to get a couple fights in before they kind of make that decision. I picked a career that I knew would, uh, what's the word? compliment the the ufc and the fighter and a professional lifestyle and thankfully i work with my wife um we do uh sometime performance trainings our business here we train a lot of athletes and combat athletes i coach at uh, my gym 36 chambers so it's all things that we can just scale down a little bit mm -hmm. my wife can take over some of the load there we can we can easily scale things down or up depending on how busy we are so i think uh you know we'll be all right i think we can make it a smooth smooth transition for sure but I definitely want to be a, a full-time fighter. And right now, the yeah, regional pay is, is not able to do that. Like you said, I mean, I got two kids to feed. They like, uh, they like playing with their Legos. Those sets aren't uh, cheap. So we got to keep them, uh, keep them happy. And, uh, you know, we got we to make that money until, until we get that call. Well, you also bring up something. It's great that you're looking forward to obviously going fighting only in the UFC. But it's also great as a fighter that you're – you picked out a career where not only could you have a great career in the UFC, but you can also build up people want to train just like you're being trained by a former UFC fighter. People want to train with former high level athletes. So you also have the advantage of you and your wife having a career where post MMA career, you can actually build the brand of your training style and your um, strength and conditioning and those type performance based stuff. So that's, that sounds like that's going to blend together very well. I think so. That's the hope. And definitely there's something about that name recognition and that prestige of being competitors. So I think uh, being a UFC champion uh, will definitely help uh, helps, uh, sell some clients. <laughs> can't hurt. Can't yeah. can definitely be a UFC champion. Definitely can't hurt any name recognition. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, I guess at this point, it's just if you have people you want to thank, you obviously already shout out your wife, but uh, sponsors, people you want to thank kind of as you as you head into Thanksgiving mode here with family and we'll obviously catch up with you probably right after you get your next match scheduled, whatever that is. Looking forward to that, man. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'd love to call uh, to thank some people. Obviously my wife, uh, Maggie, but my two daughters, me and Amelia. I know they were uh, upset I didn't drop their name last time, so I'll throw them in there. And they're awesome. They're honestly all in on this lifestyle as well. They're, they're two little gym rats. The first thing when I came home, uh, Millie, my three-year-old, wanted to watch the fight with me. <laughs> she was like, can we watch your fight? I want to see how you broke your hand. <laughs> That's my three-year-old. So <laughs> I love those guys. Um, my I have great sponsors. Um, Graham Clements, uh, he's been keeping me in one piece, uh, definitely helping me uh, keep my body sharp and ready and, and healthy. I owe that guy so much more than I could probably ever pay him. Uh, James Vose. A longtime sponsor, Daniel Branch, um, Clarity Eats for some the best salmon uh, North Carolina. That dude makes some great meal prep food. Um, I've got Toro BJJ wearing their shirt right over here. They got some soft <laughs> shirts. Check those guys out. I mean, I I'm so grateful and indebted to my sponsors for helping me keep this dream alive. It's uh, it's a pleasure working with all these guys. So I, I have a great team, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to to do big things with them. Well, absolutely. 
Uh, Adley Edwards, it's been great having you on the show again. Best wishes to you and your family and your recovery and time with them. We can't wait to have you back on. Hopefully it'll be to announce your debut with the UFC. Yes, sir. That's the hope. All right, man. We'll stay in All touch. Right. Take care, man. Yeah.